So I was going to teach a, 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 a lesson, and this, this happened last week too with me actually. Um, two weeks in a row now I've had a lesson all ready to go for what I was going to teach, and then when I get here on Sunday morning, I just felt like, I'm not supposed to teach that, I'm supposed to teach this thing, you know, and so, and so I just went and, and decided, yeah, this is what God wants me to do. And so I'm, I'm, I'm starting a series that I taught years ago, years ago, um, called Water Walkers. Water Walkers. And so I just I really feel like that uh, it, this is going to be a real encouragement to you, and I think it'll be a real encouragement to, to those out there that are watching online also. I've been walking with Jesus for 42 years now. 42 years. And when I decided to do that, I never looked back. I never looked back. I devoured God's word. Uh, I, would, um, I wasn't working at the time. I'd just gotten out of the Navy. And, and I got saved just like within a couple of weeks of getting out of the Navy. Maybe it was actually even a couple of weeks before I got out, but it was right in that transition time of getting out of the Navy. So I ended up back at my mom and dad's and staying there until I figured out what I was going to do with my life and where I was going to go from there. And so um, I was just taking it easy for a little while. wasn't in a hurry to get a job right away. Um, and so I got saved, and so I didn't have anything to do. So I would actually literally get up in the morning, wake up, and I'd read the Bible for a while. Then I'd get up and go have breakfast, and then I'd go back and read the Bible till lunchtime and have lunch. And that's all I did all day long was read the Bible, all day long. And I did it day after day after day after day for a long time. I just devoured the Word of God because when I found out the goodness of God, and I found out that there was so much to know about God that, you know, I mean, I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue, you know. Um, if you guys remember, I told you about the time that uh, before I got saved, what kind of got me going in this direction was there was a movie that came out called The Late Great Planet Earth. And it was based on a book that was written back then about end time events, about things that were going to happen at the very end of the age, before the, at the end of the, 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 the world, uh, before Christ comes back. <clears throat> and so when I was in the Navy, I was a dope smoker. I smoked pot. Forgive me. Um, so anyway, so I'm sitting there, and this movie comes out. So I'm sitting there with my roommate. And we were renting a, a mobile home off base, and I'm sitting there, and we're both stoned, OK? Just telling you the story, OK? Because uh, I want you to see where I was. So we're sitting there, in this, and we're watching TV, and all of a sudden this advertisement comes on for this late great planet Earth movie. And it looked like it shows explosions and nuclear blasts going off and all this stuff. Says, wow, that's cool. That looks like a good movie, right? And then it says all about the, something about all about the coming of the Messiah. And I was like, what? And I turned to my roommate and I said, what the blankety blank, you can fill in the blanks, what the blankety blank is a Messiah? I had some, some saying I had no clue. And he looks at me and says, Jesus, man, Jesus is the Messiah. He knew, right? I said, oh, okay, I know, I've heard of Jesus, you know. And that started me down the path, you know. So then I read the book. It says I went and got the book because I'm a book reader by far. So I read the book, and at the end of the book I realized, holy, you know what, I'm going to hell. I've never asked Jesus to be a part of my life. I thought that, you know, at the end when you die, there's this big scale there, and if your good outweighed your bad, then you get to go to heaven. If your bad outweighed your good, you go to hell. And that God would make a decision then. I did not realize that every person is on their way to hell because that we've been born with a sin nature, separated from God, and that we needed a cure. It's like you, the human race has a disease and needs a cure, yeah. right? So I realized, and so, and the, the cure is Jesus. So it's not a matter of the, do you realize that God is not judging anybody to go to hell? He's not. He's not. The judgment simply is, you're sick. Did you take the cure? If you have the cure, okay, you can come into heaven. But if you don't, then, then it's too late. See? So it's really all about just accept, and so, he realized that, and I'm getting off my here a little bit, but maybe it's for somebody out there, 
God wants to save the human race, and the only way to do that, to get rid of that sin nature, is for somebody to pay the price for that. And then Jesus came, he had no sin, he died for our sins, paid the price for us, so that we can accept the cure. And that's where we're at. So, so it's not a matter of God judging you, or anything like that. It's simply as you have a disease, if, unless you've ask Jesus into your life, and the minute you do, the Bible says, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right. Here's how you call upon the Lord. Help! In other words, because of your heart reaching out toward God, you've accepted the cure. Right. See what I'm saying? Yes. So anyway, and so uh, I found out that, that God said he'd never leave me. I found out the greatest place I, c I could walk is right next to Jesus, right next to Jesus. The Bible is filled with great people who walked with God. And I read about all those different people in the Bible. I read about Moses and Elijah and, and, you know, and, and David and, and all of those great people, Noah in the Bible, all those great people. I mean, they were people just like you and I but, but they had a connection with God. They connected with God, and they were willing to turn their life over to allow God to use them in a spectacular way, right? And so, um, the first person we see walking with God was Adam, of course, right? Um, usually it's God asking you, will you walk with me? Will you walk with me? But sometimes that walk isn't a very pleasant walk. A lot of the people in the Bible had to suffer a lot to walk with God, and I understand that. Abraham took his son on the road to Moriah where God asked him to sacrifice his son. But later, of course, he provided a ram instead. God never really intended Abraham to sacrifice his son. He didn't. He had to show a type and shadow of the fact that he himself would sacrifice his son. Yeah. See, Moses took a 40-year walk in the desert with the nation of Israel. Joshua took a fantastic walk around Jericho, right? The disciples walked to Emmaus. Paul's interrupted walk to Damascus. They were all walking somewhere. They were all traveling somewhere doing something, right? Then there's one walk that is so sad and so holy that, they, that it received its own name. Uh, the walk from the Praetorium to Golgotha called the Via Dolorosa. And that means the great way of sorrow. So Jesus took a great walk also. I'm talking about walking today because we're all going somewhere. We're all going somewhere in life, okay? Um, we've all been on a walk. You're all walking. You've, you've came from somewhere and you're going somewhere, okay? Uh, each of us have had events in our lives that belong to us alone. We went through that. Nobody else went through it. It was ours. And those walks can be filled with great times and not so great times. I think that's life, right? Amen. That's life. Um, times of joy, times of sadness. Each day is a new step in the walk. The word says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered to the Lord. And we were talking just before the service that, you know, the most important step is the one that's right in front of you. That, that we may not know what the step is 10 steps down, but if God's ordering our steps, the most important step to you is the step that's right in front of you. That's the next step. And if we can trust God enough, really, that first step is enough, right? Because we know that the next one will be fine too. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. So each day brings a time to take out a map, get our bearings, and start off on our journey. And sometimes we don't know where that's going to take us. And the reason I'm talking about walking is because there's a, a famous walk taken in the Bible. I think it's, I, honestly, to me, it's one of the most remarkable walks that I, that I can ever look at in the Word of God. It inspires me. It challenges me. It, it just absolutely thrills me. I believe it's probably one of the greatest walks a human has ever done. Probably is the greatest walk a human has ever done. 
One walk um, that has not been uh, repeated since. Peter's walk on the water. Peter's walk on the water. I think Peter's walk on the water stands for an invitation to all of us who want to experience more of the power of God in the presence of God. Because I haven't gotten that close that I can walk on water yet. It's a good example of what God can do if we let him. And that God can do what we could never do. Because if you ever want to walk on water, you're going to have to be with Jesus when you do it. Yeah. Amen? It's, if you think about it, Peter is just an ordinary guy in an act of an extraordinary trust. Extraordinary trust. Because he did trust. I know the story of Peter, we all seem to focus on, and most of the sermons you ever hear about Peter is, oh, he got his eyes off Jesus and sank into the water. I understand that, but you know what? I look at just before that, it says Peter walked on water. I look at the faith it took for Peter to get out of that boat. I look at all that. To me, I'm, uh, to me I understand that yes, Peter sank in the water, but you know what? I want to focus on the positive. I want to, I want to, I want to look at the, the fact that he did walk on water. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I can learn from the keep your eyes on Jesus part. Yeah. I can learn from that. No problem. But to have the faith to walk on water, that's something else. That's something else. But I want you to know that God always asks an ordinary person to do things that might be scary to them. He might be asking you to do something with your life that might be a little bit scary to you. But he's always there to reassure you, and he's always there to let you know that he's there with you. Always. He called Gideon a mighty warrior, but he also said, I'll be with you. There's always a decision to answer the call, too. Peter had to make a decision he's going to get out of the boat, right? And when you do, it will always change your life. It will always change your life. Always. And that's what I want. I want someday to walk on water. But I'll wait till I know I have enough faith. And it'd be really nice if I see Jesus out there first. Right? Um, but I, I want my... See, the reason I mention about how I got saved and, and saved for 42 years is I want my life to be different. When I started reading about all those guys in the Bible, I mentioned this last week, I thought to myself, why not me? I, I, I mentally acknowledge that I have the potential to do everything I see people do in the Bible. Jesus said that nothing is impossible to him that believes. I don't know how more black and white you can make that. If you can explain something different than what he just said so simply that even I can understand, nothing's impossible if I just believe. Which tells me then that the potential that lies within me to do things like I see in the Bible is there. I recognize the potential is there, but to realize that potential, that's the path I'm on. And that's the journey I'm on. That's what I want. I want my life to be different tomorrow than it is today. I want to walk in the presence and the power of God and the glory of God more tomorrow than I did, than I do today or yesterday. And I know that I can. So I want to read that passage to you, Matthew 14, 24. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And now, the, the, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be a good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter came down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, 
Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, I want you to think about something in this passage. They're in the middle of a storm. I get that, okay. And they're, they're busy taking care of business. And then Jesus comes walking on the water, and they're, first they think it's a ghost. Oh, my gosh, you know. And, and so they're in fear. Jesus speaks to them, be of good cheer, it's not I. Then Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Okay? You ever asked a question, what if that wasn't Jesus? What if it was the enemy trying to trick them? Would the enemy have still said, it is I, Jesus? Yeah. He lies. He's a, he's a liar, right? He's the father of lies. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. What I'm trying to get at is this, is Peter knew it was Jesus. Peter knew it was Jesus. Peter knew it was Jesus. I have several points I want to point out to you. The first one is, Water walkers recognize God's presence. Should be up on the screen there. On the next slide. Water walkers recognize God's presence. He knew it was Jesus. He wouldn't have, they, the enemy would have said the same things, but, Jesus, but Peter knew the difference. See you know what I'm saying? Water walkers know the difference, right? They know the difference, all right? So think about this. Jesus said, it is I, go ahead and come. What's the most important question you should ask when you're reading the Word of God? Why? You should all be shouting that. Can you get, how many hear you guys say that real loud? Why? 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 The most important question you should ask when you're reading the Bible is why. Why did Jesus tell Peter to come? Why? What was the purpose behind having him walk to him? Peter, Jesus was heading for the boat. He didn't need to come to him because he wanted to talk to him, right? So why did he have Peter come to him? I, me personally, what I see in this is any time that you're willing to take a step for God, he's going to encourage you to do it. He's not going to say, oh, no, wait a minute, you know, I don't want you to operate in that faith. No, 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 back off a little bit here. Don't get too close to me. Oh, my gosh, no. God is a great encourager. He is. I believe the whole reason, it, it, just for me personally, from 42 years of getting to know God, this is just my opinion, God's a great encourager. He loves us tremendously with all of his heart. And I believe, it'd be like me, you know, uh, it'd be like saying, oh, you know what? Yeah, come on. Yeah, come on out here with me. Yeah, let's do this together, Peter. You want to walk on water? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe... Jesus was thinking, hmm, he's the only one wanting to. What are the other 11 doing? They're spectators, not participators. Right? So, he says, go ahead and come. So imagine, you've got to think about this now. They're in the boat. Peter's a fisherman. He knows that when you're on the water, you stay in the boat. Right? <laughs> yeah, right? No brainer, right? So here he is, think about the faith of Peter at that moment. I, I know he's going to doubt later, but I want you to focus on the faith that he has until he, saw, until he got his eyes off Jesus. He's off the edge of the boat. He has to swing his leg over. You don't do that in a storm. Then he has to swing the other leg over. And now he's hanging on to the side of the boat, and then he puts his foot down on the water. At what point in all that process would you start to doubt? You know, is that water really going to hold me up, or is it going to sink into the water? And let's say it sinks into the water only an inch, though. During that inch of water, or maybe once he puts his foot on the water, a wave splashes over his foot, and he thinks, oh my gosh, no, he didn't. And then he puts the other foot down, oh my gosh, this is, it's solid. But he's still got a hold of the boat. So now he's got to let go of his safety net, right? He's got to let go of his safety net. Let go of the boat yeah. and take that step. That's faith. Right. Right. 
oftentimes when you operate in faith, you're going to have to let go of the safety net. There's no safety net. There's no safety net with faith. There isn't. You have to just, you know what, I'm just going to go out here on this limb and cut it off and hope the tree falls and not me. Right? I decided, and I'm, I'm nobody special, I'm just trying to tell you my heart. I decided I'm going to do what the Word says to do, and I don't care about the, the consequences of it. If it fails, it fails. There is nothing else I can depend on my life more than the Word of God. There's nothing I can do with my life more than do my very best to serve God with all of my heart. And no matter what happens in life, it doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. You have to realize, serving God, there's no safety net. No safety net. So he lets go of the boat. But you know what? It's still right there. He could grab it again if he starts to sink. But you know, it, he took a few steps. He did. He, he walked toward Jesus on the water, okay? Which means he got away from this. He didn't just let go of the safety net. He walked where he couldn't grab it if he started to sink. Who do you know is operating that kind of faith? See what I'm saying? We tend to focus and give Peter a hard time that he sank. Forget it. Until you've walked on water past where he went, the further distance than he went, then you can criticize Peter for sinking. There's 11 guys in the boat that sure can't criticize Peter for sinking. They stayed in the boat. Right? Yeah. But he knew that that was Jesus, okay? Peter trusted boats. He had to. He's a fisherman. But he let it go. He let it go. And I recognize that sometimes when you're in the storm, it's rough. And sometimes you don't recognize that Jesus is there. I understand that. But if you're in the Word of God, you begin to realize, you know, he did say he'll never leave me. Is that all he said, or did he say something after that? or forsake you. Now, if he just said, I'll never leave you, that means he can stand right next to you while you sink. Hey, I'm here. I didn't, I didn't leave you. <laughs> hey, breathe. <laughs> right? But he says, I'll never forsake you. That's even more important than the never leaving part. Right? Amen. Right? And he didn't forsake Peter. Right? Didn't. It also says that, that, that uh, Jesus intended to pass them by. Do you think that he was, um, wanted to impress them with just the, how he could walk on water? So he's going to pass them by and just keep on going, hey guys, look at me, I'm going, right? Jesus knew things. I, he knew ahead of time what was going to happen with Peter. Remember, he's God. Right? I think the whole walking on water thing was all about Peter. I really do. If he could walk on water, could he not instantly disappear on one shore and appear on the other? He did things like that. So why walk on water? Why, right? Why? The only thing that happened with the walking on water was the episode with Peter. So it had to be about that. Right? The verb to pass by is used to describe the defining moments when God made striking and temporary appearances to select individuals or groups for the purpose of communicating a message. I'm going to say that again. It's used to describe a defining moment when God made striking and temporary appearances to select an individual or a group for a purpose of communicating a message. He was sending them a message. He was teaching them something. Okay? God told Moses he would pass by the cleft in the rock. God told Elijah to stand on the mountain because he would pass by. Each person, God is calling them to do something extraordinary. That's what he was doing. And every time they said yes to the call of God, they experienced the power of God in their life. Every time. All it takes, like I taught a couple weeks ago, is for you to make a choice. To say yes Yes, God. 
to your way and to your will. Right? Absolutely. He wasn't just doing a neat magic trick, walking on water. He was inviting them all into the divine presence and power of God. I believe Jesus wished all of them would have said, hey, can we walk on water with you? Wouldn't that have been cool? Right? God's no respecter of persons. It wasn't just about Peter. It was about all of them. Are you getting something out of this? Are you seeing some things here? That's what I try to do. Look at what's happening here and then figure some things out. What's going on in the mind of Jesus? Why did he do that? What's going on in the mind of the disciples? Put yourself in that boat with them. Make yourself one of the disciples. What would you be thinking? Make yourself Peter in your imagination. Whoa, right? I use my imagination a lot. That's how I come up with some of this stuff. The thing started with the disciples obeying Jesus' command. Experiencing the power and presence of God starts with obedience. It doesn't mean there won't be adversity or storms, right, to get your attention, but Jesus always shows up. Yes. He came at 3 o'clock in the morning, it says. 3 o'clock in the morning. God doesn't always show up at the most convenient time. <laughs> if he's going to come to my house, I'd prefer he didn't come at 3 in the morning. Five is good. I'm up by five. That'd be great. Have a cup of coffee with him, you know. Um, but God often shows up when we're at our extreme moments. When we're at our most extreme moments, that's when he shows up. We don't know how 11 of them responded to Jesus' voice, but like I said, 11 of them became spectators not participators. Number two, water walkers have a passion for God's presence. Not only did he recognize Jesus, but he had a passion. He says, bid me to come to you. He didn't say, hey, can I go dance around the boat a few times and show off to the other disciples? No, he says, I want to come to you. I want to be where you are. I remember Moses said, God, wherever you go, if you're not going, I'm not going. I'm paraphrasing, you can read it. Moses said, God, if you're not going to go, if your presence isn't going to go before me, then I don't want to go. Now that's, that's the way I feel with my life. If, if God's not going to be in it, I don't want to be in it. I'm 65 years old, you know. I'm at the, the last part of my life, not the, be, not the beginning. So I'm looking more toward like, okay, you know what? What do you do with everything you learned and what are you going to do with the rest of your life? See? And so I've decided a long time ago, I'm just going to go where Jesus goes. And if he's in the water, that's where I'm going. So, like I said, water walkers have a passion for God's presence. So let me ask you a question. How hungry are you really for experiencing the presence of God? It's a valid question, right? How hungry are you really for the presence of God? If I was to ask you, how many of you love the presence of God? Every one of you would raise your hands. If I was to ask you, how many want to experience more of the presence of God? Every one of you would raise your hands. I'd question if you didn't. Right? But how hungry are you really for experiencing the presence of God? I can tell you how to gauge your hunger. So we're going to gauge your hunger right now. I'm going to ask you um, a couple questions, but don't answer them, just to yourself only. How can you gauge your hunger? Here's the question. How often do you pray? How often do you really, I mean, come on, get real with yourself. God already knows. You might as well, and you can lie to us, but you can't lie, and you, can, you really can't lie to yourself. The reason I say it that way is because the statistics are out there. Most Christians in America don't pray. So that means they're not hungry for God, not really. They would love to have an, an emotional experience, but they don't want to have to pursue it, right? How often do you pray? 
Another question, how often do you seek alone time with God during the week? How often do you seek alone time with God during the week? I choose to have alone time with God. I choose my morning. I make a, I make a schedule for myself. I have a habit, a, a routine. Routine's the word I was looking for. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a routine. Because if I, if I wake up in the morning and say, well, I'm going to spend some time with God, but I'll just I'll figure it out along the way, it won't happen. Because things will start screaming at me to get this done, this done, this done, this done. That's my life. That's probably your life, right? And by the end of the day, you're too tired and you realize I didn't pray. So no, you make time. You make a routine. So in other words, water walkers have a passion for God's presence. If you do not have a passion for God's presence, you will never walk on water. And maybe some of you are saying, well, I don't really want to walk on water. It's an analogy. <laughs> okay, it's an analogy about walking in the power of God. Here's the thing. People want, the, well, you know one of the, 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 the biggest basic desires of every person is a desire for power? Did you know that? You say, well, I don't really desire power. Yeah, you do. You want to control your environment. You don't want things to happen to you that you don't want to happen to you, do you? Then you want to control your environment. You do. You want good things to happen, right? And if you can make them happen, you'll, you'll, want, you'll make them happen, right? You want to control your environment. It's about control because you, you know, that's your, your security around you, if you will. That's your world. So yeah, you want your world to be the way you want it to be. If you want that, and you want it to be good, Jesus came to, and he said, I came to give life, life more abundantly. So if you want your life to be blessed and be happy and be filled with goodness, then you have to be in line with the word of God, which means then, in this analogy, you need to learn to walk on water. You need, in other words, walk, learn to walk in the power and the presence of God. Amen? And do miraculous things in your life so that you can control the environments that happen around you. And here's the thing, you have the potential to control everything that happens to you. I mean, to a certain extent, there are, like I said, there are things that are beyond your control because it's other people, don't get me wrong, but you have, a, you have the, the potential to, to control your world, maybe not someone else's. Does that make sense? So anyway, so, um, so Peter was not just a Sunday morning worshiper. See, if, if your whole desire for the presence of God is to, well, I, don't, I can't wait till Sunday to get in the presence of God, you're, you're missing what I'm saying. Because tell you what, the most intense presence of God that I've ever experienced in my life, I was totally alone. Every time that I've experienced the intense presence of God, I was alone. And if you look at the men in the Bible and women in the Bible, they were alone when they were in the presence, the intense presence of God. So Peter, he had a present, he had a passion for the presence of God, and because he had a passion for the presence of God, he was about to become a water walker. He said, Lord, bid me to come to you. And so he took a chance. Number three, water walkers discern between faith and foolishness. There is a difference between faith and foolishness. Peter blurted out, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, you command me to walk on the water. He didn't just jump out of the boat and start running toward Jesus, did he? No, but he knew that if he was following the command of God, that it would happen. See, there's the difference between faith and foolishness. Faith is following the word of God. And in this moment, when Jesus said, okay, come, that's the word of God. Because he was the word of God. Does that make sense? So foolishness is thinking that you can go and do something. Like right now, oh, you get so excited about this message that you run out of church here and you run down to the bay. That would be emotionalism, and that would probably be foolishness, and you'd probably find that out rather quick, right? Unless, of course, you have a whole lot of faith, and if you do, I want to watch. 
I do. I would love to see, even if it's not me, I'd love to see one of you walk on water. Okay? But there is a foolishness involved, right? So, courage isn't enough. It has to be tempered with wisdom and discernment. Right? If I'm not, out, I'm not trying to encourage you to go do something foolish, you know, and, or, you know, or something like that, I'm, you have to grow into this. Right? It's not, a, it's not a story about extreme sports, right? It's about extreme discipleship. There's the difference. It means that if Peter's going to get out of the boat, he better make sure Jesus thinks it's a good idea. Right? That's why he said, you command me to come, then I'll come. If it's you. I think Jesus smiled when Peter responded. Peter had enough faith to believe that he could be a part of something that had never happened in the history of mankind. Think about that. Peter had enough faith to believe that he could be a part of something that never happened in the history of mankind. Nobody else had ever walked on water. That's amazing. I would love to do something that nobody else has ever done with my faith in God. I would love that. What a, what a, it's amazing. It is. He wanted to share an adventure with Jesus. So he started that adventure with the words, command me. How often do you use those words in your walk with God? Come on, ouch! How often do you actually say, okay, God, tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it? <clears throat> Command me. Right? Yeah, command me. <clears throat> Number four, <clears throat> water walkers get out of the boat. That's a no-brainer in all this, right? So if you want to be a water walker, the attribute of a water walker is you actually get out of the boat. Like I said, right? <clears throat> the, wa the waves, the water-filled boat, the wind. It would have been tough enough to walk on water when it's calm. A whole lot different to try to walk on water when it's a storm, right? Gale force winds, waves crashing, 3 o'clock in the morning, you're terrified. But you have a sudden insight into what Jesus is doing. The Lord is passing by. So when Peter was walking on water, and there's always waves in a storm, isn't there? So when he's walking on water, did the waves come up and then separate as it went around Peter, or did they splash on him? Could have very well have been splashing on him, but he stood upright still, right? That would cause a little bit of fear. Whoa, I just got wet. Do you think he was completely dry in this whole experience? Maybe he was. I don't know. It doesn't say. But it was still a storm, because he saw it with his eyes, right? Um, just like Moses, just like Elijah, the Lord was passing by. But he's inviting you to go on the adventure of your life. And I'm here to tell you today, God is inviting you to go on the adventure of your life. My life with God has been a fantastic adventure. I've seen things happen that would amaze you. God has used me to do things that I never thought he would have, have me do. I've seen miracles happen. I've seen them with my own eyes. You can't tell me that God doesn't heal people because I've seen him heal people. He's healed people in our services. Sherry's one of them. I've seen him do miracles. I've seen him save a man that was supposed to die by midnight. We were in there around 9 o'clock at night. We prayed for him. Not that we're anything, but that God is everything. But we prayed for him, and he walked out of the hospital a couple of days later. And the doctors, when the doctors tell you you're, you're, you're going to be gone in three hours, guys, you're pretty much, it's pretty much guaranteed. I've been around hospitals enough and people dying enough. When, he's, when they say that you've only got a couple hours left, You've only got a couple hours left. They're pretty good at judging how much, because they've seen it so much. And when they told this, these people he's only got three hours left to live, so what if it was going to be five hours? The guy was still dying, right? And he was, it's not like he maybe make it. Oh, he has a 10% chance. No, it was it. We prayed for him, and two days later, whatever, for day and a half, whatever it was, he's, he walks out of the hospital. 
about a half an hour, 45 minutes after we prayed for him, he vomited up all this stuff out of him and, and instantly turned the corner and got well and was out of the hospital. I've seen miracles. Now, why one miracle happens and the other one doesn't, I don't have all the answers to that. It, it has a lot to do with, you know, just the world we live in, okay? But I'm trying to tell you is, I've seen, you can't tell me miracles don't happen. So if they happen, that means I can pursue after more and more of them because of the potential I know lies within me as an individual uh, child of God, right? So you have to ask yourself, well, no, let me put it this way. You have to come to the conclusion in your own self, why not me? Yeah, why not me? That potential lies in me too. And anything you see someone do for God that's a miracle, you can do the same thing. You could go into a hospital and pray for somebody. You could give somebody a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. Yeah. You're no different than anyone else here. No one difference. But I'm here to tell you, man, when, when you get out of the boat, anything could happen. Anything can happen. Prepare to be amazed. Prepare to be amazed. Yes, it could be scary. Yeah, you could. It could be scary. <clears throat> I believe in this story, part of the message behind this is that there's more to life than just sitting in a boat. So my question to you is, are you just sitting in a boat? Or are you doing something for God? <clears throat> well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing for God. Go do something. I don't care. Just go do it. Okay? Can, can I just talk plain to you? Get off your butts and go do something for God. You out there, go pray for your neighbor. Do something, right? Oh my gosh, I used that word in church. But I didn't mean to. See, it's, how, it's in the context that you use the word, right? <clears throat> but I'm telling tell you, if you decide to get out of the boat and do something for God, it's going to change your life. It's going to absolutely change your life. Yes. It is. I always want to be on adventure. When I was young, man, I would try anything. I did so many things when I was younger that was so adventuresome, and I'd, I just love remembering the things that I did. I'm a little more cautious now because I don't have the equipment that I had then, you know, the muscles, you know, in a younger life. But I love adventure. And I still have adventure in my life today, but I have it with God. You were, you were, you were made for more than just avoiding failure. I want to say that again. You were made for more than just avoiding failure. You don't want to do something because you're afraid you'll fail. You already failed. You already failed. Do something. And, and don't worry about failure. Just learn from it and go on. Try something else and fail at it too. That's okay. Keep on going. I want to be doing something for God when I die or when the rapture happens. I want to be doing something for God. I don't, I'm not standing around waiting for the rapture. You got to leave the comfort of your routine and go for an adventure following God. So here's an important question. What's your boat? What is your boat? And over your safety net. What, what is your boat? Yeah. What is that boat that you use? Or could I use a different word? What's your excuse? What's your excuse? You guys know I always challenge you. If you want a good message or you don't feel challenged, you can feel like you don't have to do anything when you leave here, you need to find somebody else to listen to. <clears throat> What's your boat? What is that comfortable place that keeps you from taking a leap of faith and do something exciting for God? Go down to the mall and walk around, and, and when you strike up a conversation with somebody, just ask them if you can pray for them. And you don't have to pray for them right there, and because they're probably too self-conscious to have SIPO look at them while you're praying for them. Just ask, can I be praying for you? I ask that all the time now. And there's some people that say, I don't think of anything, I'm good. Then I just say, okay, well, I'll just pray God's blessings on it for you and say, well, that's good. But I just pray for you to have a happy life and a, and a, and a wonderful life. Oh, okay, that's good. That's what they say. And some of them would tell me. I was in um, Goodwill this week, 
And because I go into good ones, I go in the book sections, uh, you know, and because I like to find in the religious section books, there's sometimes books that I, that I have that I love, and so I'll buy those because they're, they're inexpensive, and then I give them away. So, right, and things like that. Or sometimes I find a book that, oh, that looks good, I never read it, and I'll get it. So I'm in there looking at these books, and right next to the section there is a section on family. And so I'm sitting there looking at these books in the religious section, and this gal walks up and stands fairly close to me because she's trying to read the books there, you know, right? And, I, and so I said, oh, if, I, if, I'm, you know, if you need me to move over, I can move over. She said, no, you're fine. And she looks up at me and she says, I'm having trouble with my son. And I'm, I'm trying to find a book maybe that'll help me understand what he's going through. He's 13 years old and he's, he's going through a lot in life. And Do you guys think that might have been an open door for me to minister? <laughs> Is that a possibility? And think about this. I didn't go up to her, she came over here, right? You open yourself up, God will start sending you people, why? He's looking for laborers for the field. He's looking for people that are willing to say, yes, I'll talk to that person. Now some of you might have just saw her walk up and stand there and just shied over and not said anything because you're too shy to open a conversation. And I understand that. I understand we all deal with things of shyness and inferiority, t uh, being t intimidated, whatever. But you gotta, you'll never get out of the boat if you let those things, that's your safety net. You gotta get past that. So I, I shared with her, you know, you know hey, you know, uh, you know, I've got kids too and I'm talking to her and all that and everything. And, and I told her, I said, well, if you're looking for a good book, something by Dobson would be really good. Right? And I look down in that book section there, and there's a book that says, Raising Boys by Dobson. Yeah. <laughs> that was just a coincidence, I'm sure. <laughs> right? So I said, oh my gosh, I pulled the book, I said, look at this, I just saw this. She goes, wow, I said, yeah, you need this, you need this book. So she took it, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I just, you know, told her about where our church was, invited her to church, asked her her son's name, I won't say it for the sake of confidentiality, but I, but I told her I'd be praying for him and her, and I am every morning, <clears throat> and then I walked around to the other side to look at some other books. And when I walked around, I felt like the Lord said, no, you need to go back and tell her something. So I went back around, I said, you know what, I just need to tell you something else. I said, I really feel like I'm supposed to tell you this. Your son's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. God's gonna help you through this. It's gonna be okay. And I looked at her and I said, and the reasons it's gonna be okay is not just because of God, but because you're a good mother. You are a good mother. And you love your son, and you're a good mother, and you want what's best for him. And you could just see her face, just like, you know. And she's thanking me profusely. She needed somebody to tell her that. She, she needed somebody to tell her that. Amen. That's what it's all about. And you can't do that when you're in the boat. It's, all those people are outside your boat. All those people are outside your safety net, outside of your, 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 your force field of protection around you, your, your timidness, your, your low self-esteem. <clears throat> It's never going to be you doing it anyway. So if you disqualify yourself, all you're doing is, is disobeying God for one thing, right? And, and here's Jesus encouraging Peter. Come on, you can do it. Yeah, get out of that boat, Peter. You know, get out of that boat. Let's go on. Where are we at? Okay, number five. Water walkers expect problems. I kind of already talked about that. Water walkers expect problems. Peter shot off his mouth in front of the disciples, right? Now he has to do it. Now he has to do it, right? Because the wind and some people never get out of the boat. He saw the winds and waves, and yet he stepped out. Yeah, he focused later on them, but you know what? Don't think for one minute he didn't see those winds and waves before he stepped out of the boat. He did. He knew there were wind and waves out there. He did. They didn't surprise him later. He says, oh, wait a minute. I'm halfway out here. Oh, there's waves. 
He's a fisherman, he knows the ocean, right? Yeah. So he saw that there was gonna be some, di some issues there, all right? But you never step up to the plate. You'll never know what it feels like to hit a home run. There's danger getting out of the boat. But I really want to tell you this right now, guys, there's more danger staying in the boat. There really is. There's a danger of never fulfilling all that you could be. For me, another thing is the danger of I do not want to stand before Jesus and I have a whole list of things going off in my head of where I disobeyed him. Because that list is long enough already. Because I'm not perfect. I don't want to add any more to that list if I can help it. Right? He may not be thinking of my failures, but I will be. Because I'm standing in the holiness of God right in front of my face. I'm going to know that I am not worthy. And in an instant, when I look in his eyes, I'm going to know that he thinks I am. He thinks I am. So therefore, I am. Does that make sense? Yeah. Number six, water walkers accept fear as the price of growth. Water walkers accept fear as the price of growth. Yeah. All the things I challenge you to do, there's going to be a little bit of fear there. There's going to be a little, little, you know, kind of, oh my gosh, can I do this? You know, I've often said this, every time that I've operated in faith, fear was in the room. Doubt was in the room. But my faith was stronger than my fear and doubt. Because you're always going to have the enemy screaming at you. You just have to tell that voice to shut up and listen to his voice. Right? The choice to follow Jesus, the, the choice to grow, the choice for constant... Um, let me put it this way. The choice to follow Jesus and the choice to grow is also the choice for a constant reoccurrence of fear. I'm going to say that again. The choice to follow Jesus and the choice to grow is also a choice to understand that you're probably going to deal with constant reoccurrence of fear because faith is going to make you step out. And when you step out, there is a little bit of fear involved with that. Okay? Uh, but you've got to get out of the boat every day. Every day you've got to decide you're going to get out of the boat. I'm almost done here. Fear will never go away, so you might as well just say, forget it, I'm not even going to worry about it. I'm just going to do what God told me to do. I've got to that point. I don't care anymore. I'm going to do what... I'm going to walk up to somebody. I don't care if they're glaring at me. If God tells me to walk up and say, hey, God loves you, I don't care. I don't care if they're flipping me off as I walk up to them. If God tells me, you know what I'm saying? In other words, if I face opposition, but God tells me to tell them something, I'm just going to do it. What's the worst that can happen? They kill me? <laughs> to die is gain. When you get so filled with the love of God and you get so filled with how much God loves you and you get so filled with your determination to live your life uh, in, in line with God's will for your life, in other words, get out of your boat, you don't care whether you live or die anymore. Why do you think those disciples could be martyrs? Did you, do you remember when Paul was at the, at the, on, uh, on the road to Damascus? Oh, no, excuse me. It was when he was talking to, I think, Ananias, and he told him, I want you to go to talk to Paul and tell him about all the things he's going to suffer for my sake. You remember that scripture? He went and told Paul, hey, Paul, God wants you to know that if you're going to serve him, uh, you know, they're going to eventually kill you. And you're going to suffer shipwrecks and stonings and, and beatings and, and all these other things that Paul lists later that he did go through, right? He knew ahead of time he was going to go through those things because he was told they was going to go through them. And yet he did it anyway. He did it anyway. That's a guy you could live after, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. God did not call you to go to church. He called you to be the church. He called you to be the church. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would, should go and bear fruit Go and bear fruit. Go, 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 
and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. That's not saying that if I go and I do something for God, then I can ask for a Cadillac, he's going to give it to me. I'm not saying that he won't give you things. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is, is in the context of this scripture, he's saying you're going to go and bear fruit, and whatever you ask, he'll give you. What is, what is it you're asking for? That he would perform those things in your life so that you could bear fruit. It's ref the, 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 the prayer that you're asking the Father is in, reliant, in line with, in other words, think about this. I, I, I ministered, ministered to that lady, and now I'm praying for her son that I'm asking the Father in, in his name that he'll bless that child and, and his mother, right? Yep. That's what he's talking about there when he says, whatever you ask him, the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Because you're asking according to the fruit you're trying to bear in life, right? The word appointed there means to set in place. He says, I have appointed you, set you in place, established you, in a particular place for a specific reason. God has you where you're at in life to do what you're supposed to be doing in that particular place. Okay? He's directing your path. Directing your path. Psalms, uh, almost done. Psalms 29, excuse me, 92, 13. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. I want to flourish. That's why it's important to go to church. Because it, the Bible teaches us that, that pastors are one of the gifts given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. See, I'm supposed to equip you to go do the work of the ministry. And I'm not talking about teaching children's church or ushering. That's all good, too. The work of the ministry is out there. What I've been talking about all along. That's what it is. And as a pastor, I want you to experience some of the stuff I'm starting to experience now. It's, you, know, you know how good it feels to walk away from that woman knowing I just encouraged her and, and, that I'm, and she knows I'm going to be praying for her and that it's going to be okay because God actually connected with her? I want that for you. I want that for everyone that's out there. We can all do this because nobody's any different than me. Nobody's any different than me. And I'm just trying to show you as an example. I'm not trying to blow my own horn. I'm just trying to be an example to you so that you can go do something in your life, right? Um, I'm really not here to comfort you. I'm here to challenge you, right? Um, nothing, I've said this to you guys before. Nothing great happens in your comfort zone. All growth happens outside your comfort zone. Nothing, nothing miraculous happens inside your comfort zone. You want something to happen in your life, it's going to be outside your comfort zone. Okay, one last scripture. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, Jesus is talking. I want you to, expect, I want you to realize he's talking to you specifically as an individual right now, okay? Jesus is saying this to you. You did not choose me, I chose you. I chose you. Laura, I chose you, he's saying. Art, I chose you, he's saying. And I appointed you that you would go forth and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. I know I read that before, but I wanted to read it to you specifically. That's what God's saying. I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. And for your fruit to remain, it has to be connected to other people. The only way your fruit remains if it goes on after you. Right? It has to reproduce itself. So that means we have to reach out to other people. We have to. Right? Can you do me a favor? Stop discounting your disobedience. In other words, 
we make light of our disobedience to God. Well, God loves me. He understands. He understands my heart. That's the problem. He does understand your heart. <laughs> and he wants it to change. Don't underestimate the ability of your disobedience to God to cause problems in your life, but also to hinder and sabotage the good things that God's trying to do in your life. Three things I believe every person should strive for, and that's passion, fulfillment, and fruitfulness. And I spoke about all three of those. Passion, fulfillment, and fruitfulness. Fulfillment, to know that you've done something important, that, that you've done something for, you know, to touch someone's life, to, 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 uh, to touch the heart of God. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. There's no better feeling in the world. I don't care what you might feel is good. There's nothing better than that. Amen? Hope you got something from this. I'll be talking more about water walkers for the next two or three weeks. It's a series we're on water walkers. There's a lot more things I want to talk about that's in that passage. Amen? So uh, praise God.